Hi, I'm John Davis, and this is Motor Week. Join us as we see if the Mercedes-Benz E300 is ahead of the pack in hands-free driving. Classic car buying advice from Pat Goss. Lauren Morrison fills up with fuel that was once a dream. And a new Nissan Titan takes on the truck giants. So come drive with us next. Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. The Germans are here to take your driving away. Now, I know that sounds a bit alarmist, but it seems like these days all anybody wants to talk about is self-driving car technology. Now, I'm driving an all-new 2017 Mercedes-Benz E-Class equipped with Drive Pilot, arguably the most advanced autonomous driving system you can buy today. Yet even Mercedes describes Drive Pilot as more of a driving assistant than a true co-pilot. So let's drive on and see how it works and if it makes the E300 more than just another mid-sized luxury car. Whether an E-Class by name or not, there's been a mid-sized sedan in the Mercedes-Benz lineup since 1953. So they consider this 2017 Mercedes-Benz E300 the start of a 10th generation. Ergo, it's a critically important car for the brand. While the S-Class acts as the showcase for what the brand is capable of, it is in the E-Class where aspirations come down to reality and a large, diverse owner group that must be kept satisfied. Physically larger, as you would expect, wheelbase is up over two inches with overall length up just shy of two, yet it really doesn't look bigger. Power comes up from the C-Class, the now ubiquitous two-liter I-4 turbo. Complain if you will, but most buyers will likely be more than satisfied with a 241 horsepower and 273 pound-feet of torque. We were. Helping it along is an eco-minded nine-speed automatic and in our tester's case, optional 4MATIC all-wheel drive. Now on to the Mercedes-Benz Drive Pilot System, which gets you as close as you can legally get to autonomous driving. Making it happen are a plethora of cameras and radar sensors and some hefty computing power. But just how close is this technology to mass market prime time? As one colleague put it, uh, drive pilot is for when you have to drive but you don't want to, like long stretches of boring interstate or stop and go traffic. In those situations, it works pretty well. It even uses the familiar cruise control stock to activate it. Drive Pilot tries to keep you in the center of the lane, although we have noticed a little ping-ponging effect at times. And you can take your hands off the wheel, although after about 30 seconds or so, you'll get first a visual warning, then a visual and audible warning, and if you don't mind it, it will bring you to a stop. Drive Pilot navigates gentle curves pretty well, and if you want to change lanes, you put on the turn signal for a couple of seconds, and if it's clear, the car will move over to the lane next to you. But this is not a set it and forget it system. And when absolutely necessary, active brake assist will bring the vehicle to a full stop to avoid a collision. The less you worry, this E-Class is still a car that you'll want to drive yourself. Through the cones, the E300 boasts excellent agility, but also a very hefty feel. Steering was a tad light, yet it was still very precise. Power from the two liter is very respectable off the line. We hit 60 in a neat 6.6 .6 seconds, with a quarter mile passing more leisurely in 15.1 seconds at 92 miles per hour. The nine speed auto does a good job of keeping the boosted four banger in its sweet spot. Shifts were firm, but not especially fast. With an average stopping distance of 109 feet from 60 miles per hour, braking performance was great with a firm, solid pedal. On real roads, there's a peaceful highway nature that's to be expected, and when driven at a relaxed pace, the powertrain is inoffensive in every possible way. 
The interior is clean, materials exquisite, and upgrades include a wide, fully integrated dash with near panoramic gauge and control screens that look as attractive as they are functional. With many of those functions, the duty of the command console controller and its redundant fingertip controls. And we'll praise the two exquisitely neat rows of audio and climate switchgear that we tended to use most often. Seat comfort is among the best we've ever tried, with plenty of leg and headroom in front and in back, where the seat backs fold for near SUV-like versatility. The spacious trunk is more than ample by itself, measuring 13.1 neatly lined cubic feet. Base pricing is simple, starting at $53,075. Just choose luxury or sport trim, and if you want, all-wheel drive. Advanced safety and self-driving systems add another 10 grand. While most people nowadays would rather throw their luxury money down on an SUV, Mercedes-Benz thinks the 2017 E300 is worthy of such lavish loot as they claim it's not only one of the greatest cars ever, but one of the most intelligent machines ever made. That's especially true if you opt for drive pilot, but use it more as a safety net than a surrogate. But we'll just call it one of the finest luxury sedans money can buy, and one you will still love to drive yourself. We talk a lot about alternative fuels here on Motor Week. CNG, propane, biodiesel, E85, and of course, plug-in battery electric. But the promise of a super clean driving future powered by hydrogen has always been described as years away. Right now in California, however, you can actually buy and drive your own hydrogen powered fuel cell car. And what's that personal experience like? Well, we sent our FYI reporter Lauren Morrison to find out. Just this year, Honda, Hyundai, and Toyota all debuted production-ready hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, although initially they will only be available in limited areas. Things under the hood of a fuel cell vehicle look a little different than what you find under the hood of a gas or diesel vehicle. In fact, a fuel cell vehicle actually is an EV, but it makes its own electricity from hydrogen. There's no need to plug it in to recharge. To see just what one drives like, I jump behind the wheel of a Toyota Mirai sedan. Much like a traditional EV, things are very quiet and had me asking, is this thing even on? But with the popularity and petrol-hungry reputation of SUVs, it seemed only natural for me to check out this new hydrogen Hyundai Tucson as well. And again, the drive was very similar to a battery electric vehicle with that really quick get up and go. So why hydrogen over battery electric? For one, the time it takes to refuel. So it just takes a few minutes um, to fuel. And so there it's more similar to gasoline vehicles um, as opposed to charging the battery. Another plus for hydrogen vehicles, their range. The EPA estimate for the Toyota Mirai I drove is 312 miles. The Hyundai Tucson boasts 265 miles per tank, and each one of those miles is pollution-free. The only kind of emissions that come out of hydrogen electric vehicles are a little bit of heat and H2O. Even considering the energy it takes to produce, deliver, store, and transport hydrogen, or what the Fuel Cell Technologies Office defines as well-to-wheel emissions, hydrogen comes out ahead. If you look at today's uh, gasoline vehicle, on uh, average, um, based on you know, all the assumptions, we have roughly almost about a pound of carbon emissions per mile of driving. If you're producing hydrogen from natural gas, there's about half of that in terms of emissions, uh, total well-to-wheels emissions. So why aren't we all driving hydrogen vehicles? Well, it starts with the high cost of the fueling stations, the fuel cell vehicles, and the hydrogen fuel itself. But the West Coast, California in particular, is making strides. In California, the state has actually set aside funding specifically to install hydrogen stations. Similar to other alternative fuels, collaboration seems to be key in making hydrogen more mainstream. Take this fueling station in Washington, D.C. 
It's a partnership between the Department of Energy and the National Park Service. And with the station right in their backyard, the Greater Washington Region Clean Cities Coalition is making moves too. Talking with D.C. government about purchasing hydrogen vehicles now that a station is logistically available. Washington, D.C. has over the years been an innovator as it related to alternative fuel programs. And I see, again, the District of Columbia government, the Department of Public Works making some major efforts to bring hydrogen to the city. Other than California, the three automakers have yet to announce which market areas the fuel cell vehicles will be offered in next. But after my drives, there's no denying the potential and practicality of hydrogen-powered cars. So this time, the future of this future fuel looks like it may be much sooner than we thought. We love classic cars. Who doesn't? Well, Pat Gauz has some great advice if you're in the market for one. So, you think it's time to buy that collectible car that you've been dreaming about all these years. Well, that's a good thing, but unless you do it right, you might not wind up with what you think you're getting. And here to give us some pointers, we have Tony Fleming from Fleming's Ultimate Garage. Tony, welcome back to Goss's Garage. Thanks so much for having me, Pat. All right, now, this is a gorgeous Corvette, but what makes it a really top-notch car as opposed to just being a lump? Well, <laughs> a lump is well said. All right, so, uh, so start with uh, how does a car look? Uh, when you walk up to a car, is it a great looking car? And a lot of times you say, well, that's a great looking car, but you never really know why it's a great looking car, right? To make those cars desirable, things like where we paint the wheel uh, the way it's supposed to be and the wheel cover goes over top and you have that thin little pinstripe of the paint color, adding the wide whites, they're period correct, so they still look great. Uh, this car in particular is the last year that you could get the painted cove on the side. Mm -hmm. I think it looks great. I personally love those. And then you throw in the high performance engines that you could get, right? This car here, has uh, two four-barrel carburetors on it. It's the original engine that came in the car, and the car's over 50 years old. When you think about that, that's pretty cool. All right, now, another thing that I've noticed over the years that makes a big difference is the authenticity of little things like uh, the decals and the stencils and even down to hose clamps. Very well said. So the provenance of a car, whether you have some paperwork from back in the day or you have like the, uh, the, the Harrison radiator decal, the overflow tank decal, even the horsepower call-out decals on some other cars, it makes it look neat when you open the hood. And that's what the way the car would have come from the factory. This one even has the Wonder Bar radio in it. So that's original factory radio. It's a 50-year-old radio. It's pretty cool to look at. Yeah. All right. So... Unless you do your homework, you can wind up buying something that really isn't worth the dollars. This is worth more than one that doesn't have all of these things. Well, that's a, that's a very uh, important part you say there. So there's a big difference between this same car for, for let's say, 60000 versus a car for 90000 Like, what is the difference? And so some people just go out and buy a car because they see it's red and white, and they think it should bring a certain amount of money. you got to do a little homework or buy it from somebody who, who can show you the reasons why you should get that and spend the extra and keep that money. Okay. And auction may not be the best answer. Well, the auction, uh, the auction really is just putting the buyer and the seller together with no warranty whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. Tony, thank you. All right. And if you have a question or a comment, drop me a line right here at Motor Week. There's nothing like driving a new car for the first time. And we have some of the latest on this week's Quick Spin. Audi A4 Sport Luxury Sedan we tested was in 2013. We found it polished and potent then, and the all-new 2017 Audi A4 looks like more of the same. This fifth-gen styling is familiar. Audi's signature four-ring badge surrounded by an even more pronounced grille. Front lighting is more aerodynamic. LEDs during the day, Xenon Plus headlights at night with full LEDs available. The redesign flows to LED taillights with dynamic turn indicators. It's not just a sportier look, it's also a lighter, sportier ride using far more weight-saving materials, powered here by a turbocharged 2-liter I-4, delivering 252 horsepower, up 32 over last year. 
While now larger, the A4 Quattro S-Tronic Drove reacts both with more agility and more solidity. The redesign is most obvious inside. The environment is more elongated and sleeker. A top-mounted MMI display rises from the dash. The gauge pod houses a full-width TFT display as well, with a head-up display available. The 2017 Audi A4 is in dealerships now, starting at about $35,000. It may not be so much what you see, but what you get that makes the Subaru Crosstrek new for 2016. For starters, the name is shorter, No More XV. Subaru designers added refinements to the grill, headlights, and bumper, although the changes are really subtle. As for all-wheel drive, 2-liter flat 4 horsepower, it's the same at 148. Inside, there's new technology packed into this compact five-door, like the blind spot detection rear cross-traffic alert system, which is standard on the 2.0i Limited. But what really sets the Crosstrek apart from other cute utes is its abundance of both comfort and space. In fact, it came out on top during our most recent subcompact utility challenge. So while the Subaru Crosstrek may not look that new for 2017, it simply offers more of what buyers are demanding, and it's available now, starting around $21,000. The 2017 Prius Prime replaces the previous Prius plug-in and its mediocre EV-only range. The Prime's EV range is a commuter-friendly 25 miles per charge with a 640-mile total range. The Prime shares much with the standard fourth-generation Prius, but step around the front and you'll immediately see some differences. The Prius Prime has a more commanding blacked-out front fascia with taller LED fog lights and four projector LED headlights. The Prime's novel LED taillights form an almost continuous red glow at the hatch, which is now easier to lift thanks to Toyota's first use of carbon fiber reinforcement. Inside, a huge Tesla-style 11.6-inch touchscreen now dominates the interior. The Prime's updated 1.8-liter gas-electric powertrain produces 121 horsepower, the same as the typical Prius, but with a much larger 8.8-kilowatt-hour lithium-ion battery for an estimated 124 MPG-E rating. Sure, there are advantages and disadvantages that come with the Prius Prime. You get more EV driving range, but it's 300 pounds heavier. It's a little bit longer, but you lose some space on the inside. The driving isn't much different, though. They're both on Toyota's next generation global architecture, a double wishbone rear suspension. It's smooth, comfortable, quiet, handles switchbacks pretty well. So they are very close in that aspect, and that's a good thing. The hybrid system works very, very well, exactly what you'd expect from a Prius. 50 state sales of the 2017 Prius Prime begin later this fall, starting around $27,000. And we'll have more quick spins soon. In a world where customer service is often severely lacking, Joseph A. McKelly makes a case in his book, Driven to Delight, Delivering World-Class Customer Experience, the Mercedes-Benz Way. Mercedes-Benz's dedication to providing the ultimate ownership experience has been a major key to their success here in America. Of course, they make a great product, as do many other car companies. But it was the Driven to Delight program put into place by MBUSA CEO Stephen Cannon that has made the Mercedes-Benz ownership experience an unrivaled one and a pattern for the rest of the industry and all businesses to follow. Last year, Nissan made quite a splash with the full-size Titan XD, a brawny V8 turbo diesel truck aimed squarely at the sweet spot between light and heavy-duty pickups. Well, now comes the ever more important half-ton Titan. As the volume entry against the big three, let's see if they have anything to worry about. Nissan Titans on the road, but this full-size truck has only been a modest success for the brand, and there were rumors it might not be redesigned. Well, bury that thought. 
Clearly, Nissan is after a much larger piece of the full-size truck pie with a Gen 2 ground-up Titan redesign for 2017. Now, bowing to reality, Nissan doesn't expect to lure away many diehard Ford, Chevy, and Ram buyers, but rather attract first-time big truck buyers, especially import brand owners, with a fresher full-size entry. Although, all Titans are U.S. built, assembled in Canton, Mississippi. Powering their sales goal is Nissan's updated 5.6-liter Endurance V8, now with 390 horsepower and 394 pound-feet of torque, connected to a 7-speed automatic transmission. A more fuel-efficient V6 arrives later. On the road, Titan feels every bit as solid and formidable as its domestic competition. But when you arrive in the parking lot or a tight driveway, it feels more maneuverable. You might think it would feel less powerful than the larger XD diesel, but with a whopping 1,500 pounds less weight to haul around, it feels every bit as menacing, and it can do almost as much work towing up to 9,390 pounds. The look is big truck cumbersome, though surely Nissan would prefer to call it bold, having much more in common with the XD than the previous Titan half-ton. But there's 11.8 inches less wheelbase and about 15 inches less to overall length than the XD. And even with a more macho appearance, aerodynamics are 10% better than the original Titan. Platinum Reserve trim is available to appeal to luxury-minded buyers and the Pro 4X for the rugged types. The latter includes 18-inch wheels with 275 70ATs, Bilstein shocks, skid plates, and a locking rear diff. The new Titan is available as crew cab only at launch with a five and a half foot bed, a foot shorter than the XD, but King and single cabs will follow shortly with beds up to eight foot. Productivity aids include adjustable tie downs, LED bed rail lighting, and a kick out bed step. Stepping up into the driver's seat, you'll find plenty of comfort for long hauls, as well as lots of big knobs on the center stack. Here, things are mostly the same as in the XD, with just about every convenience feature you expect available, including navigation, heated and ventilated seats, heated steering wheel, a round view monitor, trailer brake controller, Rockford Fosgate audio, and even remote start. The crew cab's rear seat area is incredibly roomy, and those seats are configurable for both seating and multiple storage options. Plenty of bins and big cup holders are found throughout the cabin, too. 4x4s get a traditional part-time setup with dash-mounted selector, as well as a bit more ground clearance. Titan can handle a wide range of conditions and feels very rugged when banging through obstacles. Now off to the track, where we found a bit of the usual empty bed V8 pickup wheel spin with our Pro 4X 4x4, but still got off to a 7.3 second 0-60. Power builds gradually all the way up the tack until shifts happen quickly with little loss of momentum. 15.8 seconds was our best quarter mile time at 92 miles per hour with a nice low growl from the exhaust. Handling was very similar to the rest of the full-size brigade, top heavy and slow to react. No better or worse than any others we've tested. Steering felt a little heavier than expected, but this Pro-X is geared more towards romping over things than scooting around them. Government fuel economy ratings are 15 city, 20 highway, and 17 combined. We only managed a 16.2 miles per gallon average on regular. So the energy impact score is quite poor at 19.4 barrels of annual oil use, along with 8.7 tons of CO2 emissions. While not a bargain, it is certainly competitively priced, with a base Titan nest starting at $35,975. Add about three grand for 4x4, or step up to the Pro 4X with standard four-wheel drive at $46,215. We doubt the big three or even Toyota will admit that Nissan's new Titan is a concern. Still, we think they are heading in a smart direction both with this volume leader 2017 Titan and the heavier duty Titan XD. And we also think that even the most jaded truck owners could find a lot to like in the new Titan lineup. Plus now there can be no doubt, Nissan is in the full size truck game to stay. 
Well, that's our show. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, for more Motor Week, including daily updates, podcasts, and even complete episodes, cruise on over to pbs.org slash motorweek. And I hope you'll join us next time when we see if Jaguar's first SUV was worth the wait and BMW hopes to take hybrids to a new level. Till then, I'm John Davis. We'll see you right here on Motor Week. To learn more about Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine, visit pbs.org slash motorweek. This program was produced by Maryland Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. I tend to think of myself as, as, uh, as pretty quiet and shy. Um, I, I, I like to think I, I've, I have a good amount of confidence, but I kind of keep it reserved. I eat lots and lots of fruits and vegetables, as you can imagine. I waste very, very little um, in, in my household, and uh, I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life, or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. If you start the day with a healthy meal, I guarantee you, you're going to feel better throughout that day and throughout that week. You'll be more motivated to do, to do better in school, to get a better job to maybe go work out or, or be more successful. And so it's really unfortunate that our food system is set up so calories are cheap, but nutrition is expensive. We're looking to change the face of produce to make it really accessible, really affordable for people that really need it. So if you walk down a grocery store aisle and you see perfect looking apple, perfect looking apple, perfect looking apple, imperfect looking apple, meaning it's too big or too small or it has a bruise on it, you wouldn't choose it in a grocery store and that would get thrown away, right? We use the perception of it's not what it looks like, it's what it tastes like. And even the ugly stuff tastes even better than the stuff you would find in a grocery store because it's not processed, it doesn't have wax on it, it's straight out of the grounds, right? So it's even fresher and it tastes even better than the stuff you find in a grocery store. So our company's called Hungry Harvest. We have three different options. We have an organic, we have a recovered box, and we have an all fruit option. We sell produce with purpose. We hire people that um, were formerly in, in prison. We hire people that were formerly injured or, or were sick, that are living in homeless shelters, that are really looking to get back on their feet and, and for a second chance in life. Well, I, I live, breathe, and literally eat Hungry Harvest. So this is my entire life. I'm, I'm not unsatisfied at all, not having a, a life outside of Hungry Harvest. This is what I do, and I love what I do. I play golf every, every so often, you know, during the summer, but really, I just love coming to work, and when you love coming to work, you don't consider it work at all. I consider it just what I do, right? And I'm always thinking about Hungry Harvest and how we can improve, and I can self-improve myself to be a better leader and CEO. Shark Tank is a TV show where entrepreneurs go on and pitch a panel of celebrity and high net worth judges. I walked on, I was really nervous, you know, they, they do this thing where you're standing in front of the doors and they do this countdown where it's like 10, 9, 8, and they do this countdown, I'm pretty sure to scare the hell out of any entrepreneur that's about to walk down the Shark Tank. So when I got a deal with Robert Herjavec, um, that was the closest to euphoria I've ever felt in my entire life. Um, to work so, so hard on something and dream about something for so long that you just, you want it so bad, and then to see it validated on national TV, I couldn't hold back and I was ultimately brought to tears by it, by the, by the experience. It was just really humbling and honoring. I'm an avid traveler. I love, love to travel the world. Um, it's my dream one day to just travel the world, go to South America for a year and, and go to go to different countries for a year and just see how the how they how people interact and see the culture and taste the food. I really love food as you can tell. And uh, I just really want to meet every single person, right? To see everybody's stories and how people live and, and uh, it's a beautiful planet, why not why not see it? I wake up every day with a smile on my face just knowing that no matter how bad this day is, I'm still waking up and coming to work and it's a great cause and, and it's it's just so much fun that we have in this office every day. Mm -hmm.